hopefully a segue from where General Formica was, and I want to talk more about hypersonics today. And I too talked about hypersonics and hi hypersonic threats uh, last year at this event. But I want to focus today on the imperative for the defense, why we need to be considering the defense. And I, I absolutely buy into what General Formica says about offense, defense, and mix. He's been saying it so well for years. We need to continue to talk about that. But there are still some out there, believe it or not, who are saying this hypersonic challenge is just too hard. It, it's, it's not solvable. We're going to spend too much, way too much money on it. Let's just focus on the offense. It's almost the problem in reverse. Yeah. It's almost the problem. If we just, just do this big offensive strike stuff, we don't have to worry about the defense. I think that, too, is not a good way forward for our nation. So I want to build the case for you today about why the defense, why the imperative for defense, why the defense matters, and almost the argument in reverse. It's got to be a defense-offense mix as well. Now, hypersonic, or as my friend Tom Carrico will cringe, hypersonics uh, is certainly the, the buzzword of the day, uh, of the year, of the last couple years in missile defense. There's a lot of talk about it. I used to put $5 in a jar every time left of launch was mentioned, and I eventually bought a Tesla with it. Right? Uh, today, I've got a new jar, and uh, every time hypersonic is invoked, I put another $5 in. I don't know what I'm going to buy yet, but it, it'll be, the, the, the jar is growing in amounts. Um, Melanie Marlowe did a podcast on it recently and War on the Rocks about the, all the hype on hypersonic or hypersonics. Um, indeed, it's, a, it's, it's an oft overused term. A lot of people don't really have a great grasp of what it really means. So I want to talk a little bit about that today and generally accepted that, you know, by the public definition, is something that travels greater than Mach 5. And that's, I think, maybe the Webster sec definition, but we've seen and observed in flight testing and we've actually seen these things flying from our adversaries in the Mach teens and the Mach 20s. So it's a vexing problem for sure. And our adversaries have tailored this threat to fly in between our existing defenses. They've deliberately developed it and built it to sort of make, not make our existing defenses obsolete because that's not true, those are still very important, but to fly their way around those existing defenses and set sensors. Our sensors can't even today reliably see it or track it, at least not birth to death. And so a perfectly timed misdirection could draw us into a con conflict with the wrong adversary. It's a serious problem. So what do we do about it? Well, there's no such thing as a free breakfast, ladies and gentlemen, so I'm going to ask you to participate. Everyone has to raise their hand one way or another <laughs> to the extent you have an opinion. And when you think about the hypersonic threat or a series of them, do you think it's more of a regional threat, more of a threat to our presence in the forward regions, or do you think it's more of a threat to the homeland? Just, there's no right or wrong answer. I just like your opinion. Everyone has to vote. So tell me if you think it's more of a regional threat to our nation. Okay, that's uh, maybe 40% of the room. I'm, I'm guessing then you think it's more of a threat to our homeland? Don't be shy if you think it's more of a homeland threat. Okay. And I don't know if there's a right or wrong answer here. In fact, it's, both. It's, both. it's both. Okay, but maybe that's the right or wrong answer. But I guess my point was, for me anyway, if where the focus needs to be in the defense, my opinion, personal opinion, is that it needs to be focused more in the regional context. It's still very, very strategic, but it more is more, to me, today, more of a regional threat, and our adversaries wouldn't choose to use this threat on the homeland before they might choose to use it in a deployed area. Think about our forward presence in a carrier battle group. Think about Guam, Kadena Air Base, our shipping lanes, our commerce, our freedom of navigation. Even if you calculate that the strategic threat will never materialize, there's no denying the regional threat, and without the ability to counter it, we will slowly and steadily be pushed back and boxed in. Even if a hypersonic missile is never launched in aggression, we are on the back foot, constantly withdrawing, moving out of harm's way, unable to stand our ground, or we are knowingly leaving our blood and treasure unprotected in that harm's way. The rippling geopolitical implications are no less severe. Every political, economic, social act taken today is a luxury afforded by the presupposition of physical safety a presupposition of often taken for granted, yet nevertheless guaranteed by our great United States military. This protection has led to global growth, freedom, and prosperity unprecedented in human history. But now that very system is at risk through these threats to a single party system seeking to supplant it. Even if no kinetic strike is ever launched, the shift in balance will have drastic consequences. As the United States goes, so too goes world order, I would argue. So the scenario we are facing, the problem that we must solve, in my opinion, it's much more of a strategic theater issue, but a regional one with heavy strategic consequences. So 
So how do we stop it? For such a dire situation, the solution is actually conceptually simple and the subject of my talk today. We defend. We must change the game. It's our imperative. Now, for those of you in the room who are offensive strike zealots or believers, and, and to some degree I am too, rest easy, because strike is an integral part of this defensive posture. Just as you can't launch a strike if you've been knocked out of the game, defenses can only endure for so long before breaking. The ability to hit back lessens the damage we need to absorb to, to survivable levels. Offense and the defense, as General Formica so eloquently just told us, need to work together in all phases. But if we have no defense, our adversary's calculus is simple. Their missiles will land, they can plan their attack, they have singular control of that dimension in the forward regions and push us away and push us out. But with a capable defensive system, the stakes for pulling the trigger for them just got a lot more complex and a lot bigger. And the adversary no longer holds all of the cards. With any formidable defense, the adversary's 100% certainty drops and the risk and calculus increases exponentially. What does it take to ensure that decapitation strike succeeds? How many missiles do they actually need to sink that carrier? They have to think now more about it, as opposed to having freedom of action, at least in the region. Indeed, defensive systems buy us time, plenty of time, in fact, to both respond to an aggression and, due to an adversary uncertainty, time to fully employ our own instruments of national power. Now my final point regarding the imperative for defense, it's important to bring up that history has already shown us the way. The mere idea of a credible defeat system, decades ago an SDI drove the Soviets to try to build enough capacity to assuredly overwhelm our systems, but they never knew how much that really was. And with our continued investment in missile defense, that finish line get, kept getting farther and farther away. For every dollar we invested in defense, they had to invest far more in their offense. This formulaic relationship ensured the uncertainty of success was not only present, but ever growing, becoming an ever more efficient deterrent for us. So in reality, the defense posture is proven. It works, and it's absolutely a necessary part of the equation. But again, I'm struck by the fact there are still naysayers out there saying, let's just focus on offensive strike with regard to hypersonic threats. We don't need a defense. I absolutely think that we do. But if you're gonna do it, you absolutely need to do it right. <clears throat> Whatever the solution, it needs to be thorough, and it needs to be robust, and it can't be a band-aid. It has to be thorough and robust enough that it cannot be easily disabled by resetting the adversary's con-ops to a defense-free scenario. The defensive architecture must be resilient, and once again, band-aid fixes are not resilient. So let me offer a few thoughts, philosophically, on how we might go about this. First, we need to execute, and we need to do it efficiently. Given the complexity of this threat, that means a layered defense. Absolutely need a layered defense. No one Band-Aid in any one of the regions or the regimes of flight or a last chance terminal, ter terminal defense Band-Aid is going to be sufficient by itself. We've got to get at this threat at the glide phase, and that means a lot of things, including a space layer, which thankfully they're starting to see signs now of progress toward that end. We're not there yet. But uh, I noticed in some, some recent action across the street here, there are some good signs. And a space layer is clearly the first step. Because as my friend, Vice Admiral John Hill likes to say, if you can't see it, you can't hit it. And we need to take that first step, finally. And it also means a new interceptor. The existing, I'll just call them inventory of interceptors, and strapping extra boosters out of them, trying to modify them somehow, are not sufficient enough, technologically, to handle the advanced threat at the speed at which it flies. So we have to consider that. But really my point is about a layered defense, a proven concept in conventional missile defense. It's also necessary here to provide credibility against hypersonic threats given the shortened windows of engagement. Due to speed, we need to see the threat. Due to maneuverability, we need to be ready to intercept the same threat at multiple points simultaneously. A networked layered approach uniquely provides this capability while also minimizing the number of assets needed at any one time, as the subsequent layer only needs to deal with those threats that have leaked through the previous layer. Layered defense preserves the economic viability of any defensive option. So one, layered defense. Two, our execution requires new technology. Existing systems are fundamentally incapable of addressing, addressing this threat based on their foundational conception for countering conventional and altitude-based or altitude-layered battle spaces. 
Our current systems are designed for either EXO or ENDO, atmospheric intercept. Conceptually, those two categories might as well be as different as defending against missiles and defeating against torpedoes. Assets tailored to each type of those flights lose their efficacy when out of their element, and hypersonic threats skip along the barrier between EXO and ENDO strata like a rock on a pond and travel freely between them like a dolphin jumping on waves. The implications go far beyond physical intercept mechanics, affecting all other aspects including visibility, identification, and predictability. No number of updates to existing infrastructure will be sufficient to change their fundamental development philosophy, especially not in an economically feasible way. Consider the new elements that need to be made. Which brings me to my third point, and that's really about it's got to be all about an architecture. Yes, we absolutely must build upon the massive wealth and knowledge of our existing missile defense systems and components that we have, but I'm not talking about throwing away the existing ballistic missile defense system. That remains important, but we need to continue to do more, and we must take a fresh look at the hypersonic challenge and problem rather than trying to MacGyver I hope that's not an analogy lost on many of you younger people in the room. <laughs> Rather than trying to MacGyver something on top of what we have in hopes of getting to something good enough. Good enough today is obsolete tomorrow. And with hypersonic threats, chasing good enough is an exercise in futility. Finally, achieving proper defense requires true commitment from both industry, where I reside today, and government. The MDR got us off to a good start, but rhetoric is only the beginning. The nation needs a strong commitment to funding counter hypersonic efforts, such as a new space layer, as I've mentioned, a new kinetic interceptor, or interceptors perhaps, that build on a layered defense that I talked about. Investment also in non-kinetic things like electronic attack and cyber and directed energy. Those things all hold promise and are all important part of that layered defense equation. And most often overlooked, the command and control architecture to knit these assets together and make them function as a system rather than a standalone entity band-aided on to the existing BMDS. Doing this right is going to mean to have some entity of leadership integrating all of those critical elements together so that we don't Frankenstein our way into solving this problem. There needs to be some sort of a super integrator, an orchestrator assigned, resourced and empowered to ensure we get this architecture right. It can't be done with discrete parts, but taking a systems of systems approach is as essential as any single element of the architecture. The interaction and seamless cooperation of these various elements of counter hypersonics must be baked into the very requirements of future programs. Those requirements are the standards to which industry is held and against which solutions are judged and ultimately awarded. For our part, industry must work together to help government partners choosing to invest, helping to inform, and assisting them in making these requirements so they are clear and concise. We need to be involved early, which is now, actually yesterday, helping to make sure these systems work well and integrate together. So layered defense, a series of new technologies, an approach that thinks architecture first, and commitment from our government and industry partners. I'll leave you with this. There's a lot we need to do in this area, and every reason to do it. So we need to get it done. This threat is serious. It's real. We need to consider the defense. We can't do it just with a strong offense because, as General Formica says and points out so well, the offense-defense mix is so vitally important, and it holds true here in the world of counter-hypersonics. Thank you very much, and I look forward with General Formica to your questions. Thank you.